Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Databases, Containers, and Pods, SQL Server and Kubernetes. I'm Joey D'Antoni. I'm Principal Consultant at Denny Cherry Associates Consulting. And in the next 20 minutes, uh, we're going to have a demo pack session talking about SQL Server running on containers. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the overview and why you want to run on why containers are a good idea. Does anyone out there like installing database software? It takes about 50 clicks and usually about a half hour. I know it's not the most productive part of my usual day. Well, one of the benefits, if you haven't already automated that process, of using containers is we don't have to do those painful long installs, worrying, worrying about getting media to machines. Uh, we greatly simplify that process. Furthermore, with Kubernetes, we even simplify the process of building out high availability solutions like failover clustering uh, or always on availability groups. So we're going to talk through where that applies in each version of SQL Server. And we'll do some demos of how you would do a rolling patch upgrade, how you would support a failover, and maybe even an availability group demo. So if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes does a few things. So this is a project that came out of Google. So if we think that we can thank Google, this is what they use to run their data centers. And the best way I've, I've seen it described is kind of a, a virtualization platform for the cloud. Uh, and this really applies not just if you're in the public cloud like Azure or any of the other public clouds, but if you're building your own infrastructure uh, on-prem, a lot of these concepts that you'll learn about in Kubernetes, like using uh, software load balancers, software-based networking, or software-defined networking, uh, infrastructure as code, those are all going to apply in an on-prem Kubernetes world, and they're also going to apply in a cloud. So most of the demos I'm going to do are on my laptop running Minikube, but I also have my AG demo running an Azure Kubernetes service. So you have multiple options as to how you can deploy, but the main things we get are orchestration, built-in high availability, and network management. Fundamentally, containerization is not that different from virtualization. We're just going a couple layers down the stack and going closer to the OS. And why else do we want this? SQL Server 2019 Big Data Clusters. So if you didn't hear the announcement this morning, uh, Microsoft introduced uh, kind of a really interesting new solution that's part of uh, SQL, 2019, SQL Server 2019. And that involves uh, Kubernetes, Spark, and, and Python, and HDFS, and the ability to connect to all these other databases. That's all only going to run on Kubernetes right now, and a couple of other options. But it's container-based. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the biggest is we get a lot of flexibility in ease of deployment. So Kubernetes is an orchest container orchestration system that came from uh, Google and is re was referred to as the Borg there. It also comes from the Greek word meaning helmsman, and that's the person who steers the ship. The logo is the wheel of the ship, so it does, it does a lot of things. So it provides self scaling, uh, self-healing, load balancers, and we're going to take advantage of those load balancers quite heavily in our SQL infrastructure because that's how we're going to persist our server names. It's a concept that if any of you have ever worked with SQL Server failover cluster instances, it's very similar to in nature. It's going to be a little bit different, but kind of similar. This is written in Go, and it's frequently uh, deployed in conjunction with Docker, or maybe even the Microsoft Container Registry, which is what we're using uh, for the SQL Server 2019 beta images. So that's Kubernetes at 10,000 feet. If you're new to this, just think of it like virtualization, just closer to the, li to the core libraries. And you can get denser because you don't need the whole oper guest operating system for each container. So SQL Server and containers. Did anyone know that SQL Server 2017 supported Kubernetes? No hands. This didn't make a lot of news. It had some basic uh, Kubernetes support. The first couple of demos we're going to do are going to be on 2017. Uh, I think this was an unheralded feature. And there were two kind of major gaps that why this didn't go any further. It didn't support AD authentication, which is probably the biggest uh, limitation that I saw. And it also didn't have a SQL Server agent. So the agent jobs weren't available. So it was more a proof of concept, but it's fully supported and documented in books online. 2019, we have this big data cluster option, but we also have a lot more options. We have availability groups, which are available today. Uh, Active Directory authentication is a work in progress and being worked on, in mat as well as matching the full uh, surface area of SQL Server. We also have this scale out virtualization. I'm not going to cover that in the 20 minutes, but if you have any questions, swing by the booth, and we have plenty of folks that will answer your questions. 
Now, let's jump into a demo. So the first demo I'm going to show you is kind of the basic of failover and how we deploy a SQL Server in a Kubernetes cluster. So I have to log in here real quick. And so this is my Ubuntu server. Uh, this is just a VM running uh, Minikube, which if you want to get started with learning Kubernetes is a good It's a fairly easy install that you can get up and running pretty quickly. But I'm going to show you a couple of things. The first thing that's kind of important and was always kind of problematic with running databases on containers is that we think of containers as being much more ephemeral as VMs. Containers go away. And we don't want our data to go away. That's a bad thing. Last I checked, anyway. So we have to define persistent storage. So here, I'm going to show this directory. And I have a file called pvclaim.yaml. And this is going to define my storage. So the way I'm going to define persistent storage in a container is using a persistent volume claim. You're going to define all of your infrastructure in these YAML files. You'll note they are space and case sensitive. So when you get errors, it's because you, you copied and pasted incorrectly or, or you got your spaces wrong. Uh, but what this is going to do is persist a 10 gigabyte volume for my databases. And so what does that mean? Uh, I'm going to have a volume that's always here. So if I look and I say cube control get service, I see that I have a load balancer. That's my MS SQL deployment. So that load balancer is going to be my server name. I'm going to have this storage persisted. And then I'm going to have a pod. And a pod is our unit of container, unit of container deployment in Kubernetes. So I'm also going to have a SQL Server pod. And that's called MS SQL deployment, this kind of GUID-ish, not really a GUID kind of name. So let's look at how I built that. And once again, I see I have this deployment. At the top of my deployment script, I define my load balancer. We're on port 1433. Uh, my API version is apps beta 1. Uh, I'm using uh, SQL Server on Linux 2017, cumulative update 10. Uh, I've defined my password as a secret, so it's going to pull that in. But this is up and running now. We're also reflecting that storage that I referred to, and it's going to mount that storage as var opt MS SQL. So if I log in here, and I'm going to create a database called Ignite Demo. And I am using uh, SQL CMD here, but we also have this great cross-platform tool called Azure Data Studio uh, that is quite handy. So I'm going to exit. And here's what I'm going to do. This is going to be kind of a failover scenario. So this is more like what we would do with a failover cluster instance. So we're going to have an aggressive v uh, VM admin who's going to say, hey, that database pod sure is taking a lot of system resources. Pardon me while I cut and paste. And I see that my pod is now going. But what I see happening here is it's terminating the pod that I just deleted. And it's recreating, uh, creating a new one. So this is going to take about 30 seconds. And I can see the age of my, my uh, new container in seconds there. And I'm going to give it a few more seconds before I try to log in, because it'll fail otherwise while SQL's coming back to life. I may have to do this one more time. Let's see if we get in. So what's going on here is SQL Server is doing a normal crash recovery. This is effectively like if you uh, stopped the service and restarted the service. We're in. And now if I select name from sys.databases, I can see that my Ignite demo database is there, along with a few other demos where I've done this presentation. That's the basic failover approach. So that's kind of built in. You have high availability. You didn't have to configure a cluster. You didn't have to install SQL in a funny way to make it clustered. Uh, that's just built in and deployed. That's how kind of SQL Server on Kubernetes works. Now, I'm going to show you a video here. Uh, 
that's a little bit of a different scenario. This is where we patched uh, SQL Server. So hold on, let me hit play here. And so we see our pod, and we're going to connect, or actually we're going to show the version here using, uh, using Azure Data Studio. And this is going to be at cumulative update 9 when I run this. Pardon my fumbling and typing. So here we see we're at CU9. So if I want to fix that, I'm going to update my deployment file to change it to CU10, which is what I'm doing here. And now I'm going to deploy this by saying cube control apply dash F. You see that my deployment was configured. Similar thing happens. I get a new container that's going to go ahead and create. And it's going to terminate my old pod and run this one. Uh, in reality, the reason why I videoed this, this took about six or seven minutes to deploy uh, in, in, uh, in an environment. And the deployment time didn't take very long. So the new container comes online. It just takes SQL Server a little while to apply the patch. So SQL Server is going to do the upgrade steps that happen against, against the instance. Six minutes is longer than it would usually take uh, in my experience, but it, it, it took that long. So. Let's zoom forward a little bit here. And so there we can see the SQL logs going. Uh, and that's the patch kind of going in, the other, uh, in that other window. And if I connect here now and rerun when this is done, we can see that's going on. So one of the other things to note, you'll use the cube control command to, to do everything. And I can generate logs from my, uh, from my environment by using kube control logs and then whatever, whatever system object in Kubernetes I want to use. In this case, I'm getting the logs from my SQL container. Those are going to write to standard out, uh, which is a little bit hard to find within your cluster, uh, but it's easy from the command line here. So here I can see we're upgrading database mail. Recovery is complete, so we're good to go log in here. So now as I rerun, select add add version. I am now upgraded to CU10 of, uh, of SQL Server 2017. So this was just kind of a basic patch scenario. Uh, it's very similar in the way that you would do a rolling upgrade if you had a clustered environment. The problem was that takes a decent amount of downtime, right? Because we're down for a little while while that patches, and we kind of only have a single node. Uh, the fix for that? always on availability groups, uh, which we have in SQL, Ser in SQL Server 2019. So let me pop back to PowerPoint for a second. So what I just showed you was very simple in terms of interaction between SQL Server and Kubernetes. Uh, with availability groups, we have a much deeper, uh, a deeper set of solutions. So, in addition to our, our SQL container, we also have an agent uh, running within our pod uh, that has a secret, and that's going to do the orchestration uh, for the availability group. We also have a, a, an operator that's going to manage everything for us. These are all, these are all Kubernetes type things. Uh, we can expand this. So this is just a three node example, which is what the demos on Books Online are going to have. And we'll kind of walk through that here in a second. So just to kind of show you the file path here, I have the same thing with my persistent claim, uh, except here I have three nodes. So here I have persistent uh, claim MS SQL data one, MS SQL data two. I'm specifying 80 gig. And the kind of beautiful thing about all of this is when you're using Kubernetes, you're forced to define all of your infrastructure as code. And I know we talk a lot about infrastructure as code. And all of you keep your infrastructure and source control, right? No hands, once again. Uh, you kind of have to do it here, so it, it really becomes a reality. And so we define, these, we define these volumes. And then there's an uglier script here that 
We'll define our operator. Uh, and this is going to define how we manage. And it's also going to define the namespace that we're working in. And then finally, our SQL servers. So here we're going to define all of our SQL servers. Uh, you still have to accept the, the license agreement from Microsoft. We're going to grab the container image, uh, and we're going, to pu we're going to pull that down, pass in our SA password, and go ahead and deploy this. So here, just to show you, Ah, uh, sorry, t demo typo. So there I have my service for AG1 primary. And then here I see that each, uh, each of my nodes has a, uh, has a load balancer and I have agent running. So I have each of those nodes running and I can connect. Right now I can connect just to my primary. except that was the wrong IP address. And we're, we're going to give up on that one. The one other thing I want to show you that you can do as part of the uh, Azure Kubernetes service is you can get the Kubernetes management interface running local on your machine. So I'm just going to launch, the, I launched this from my machine. And I can see I have my AG1, and I can change my namespace to AG1 and see a little bit more. And here I see my pods uh, for my environment. I see how much CPU they're consuming. Uh, I see the nodes in my infrastructure. And like I mentioned, this is all running in Azure as a managed service. However, uh, I still get this interface local to my machine. So this is a really cool way to, to do this. So there are a lot of advantages to running uh, your database containers on Kubernetes. The biggest is you get high availability with minimal configuration. So you, do, you have to do a lot less once your infrastructure is instantiated. Uh, the other bit, you get a lot of flexibility ar around deployment. So you can deploy on-prem, cloud, and you have the same kind of deployment. And you get consistent deployment because you're not necessarily you know, having somebody click through to install every time. You're using infrastructure as code all the way down to your VM sizes. So it becomes a very easy way to standardize your environment. With that, I have about a minute and 15 seconds left. Does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand and yell. Yeah. Question was, do you only have to do this with Linux containers? The answer is right now, this is like about a 99% Linux solution. Uh, and frankly, Kubernetes is a Linux thing. I know Windows Server 2019 does have Kubernetes support, but I think you're running Linux under the hood somewhere in there. Uh, as far as SQL Server here, it is a Linux only solution. Any other questions? Yeah. You're going to have to yell. Uh, so the question was, I think, uh, was that SQL 2019 or SQL 2017? Everything I showed you in Ubuntu was SQL 2017. Uh, the availability group thing I showed you that was running on AKS is SQL 2019 only. But if you just want the high availability component, you can run that in SQL Server 2017 now, uh, just with the limitations. Any other questions? I'll be here after. Thanks, everyone.